Red Smith, the dean of American sports writers, says it lies somewhere between the roller derby and the ice show. But the hype goes on. And it works because to a lot of people, Arnold just looks so good. You can have the best product in the world, but if you don't know how to sell it, and if you don't, know, if you don't have anybody who can sell it for you or tell the public, it's a waste of time, the whole thing. It's not unlike the Farrah Fawcett Majors phenomenon. Mix a little talent for doing something and a lot of good looks and plaster the concoction everywhere and you have a phenomenon, a vital commodity. For without such phenomena, magazines like People would become tongue-tied. Am I married? No, I'm not married. <laughs> Why? <laughs> when we return, Arnold turns iron into gold. Sorry, I'm pumped up already. <laughs> the country displaying himself, which is, after all, the main work of a bodybuilder. He lets almost everything hang out, as they say, leaving a trail of fantasies for young women and some men. After all, mystery is what a star is all about. And wherever he goes, he sells bodybuilding and thus the paraphernalia of bodybuilders. Not everyone, however, finds a bodybuilder the body beautiful. Sorry, I'm pumped up already. <laughs> If you go to the Metropolitan Museum, or if you go to any of the great museums of Europe, you will find pieces of sculpture that thousands and thousands of people have gone to see for three or four hundred years, which they admire as an item of considerable beauty. Um, but when that piece of sculpture turns into the flesh, people are somehow frightened by it. And uh, I think that's got to do with the fact that bodybuilding as an art form at this time is so profoundly original and so far ahead of its time. People just aren't ready for it yet. But the final performance, the three-minute posing routine that one does on a stage is then much more than like a, a dance or like ballet. Tchaikovsky is important to bodybuilding, but not nearly so important as the mirror. It's the only way a man can tell how his pectorals are doing. But I don't know any bodybuilders who then, after they're through with the training, go home and look in the mirror and say, wow, handsome devil. You know, this doesn't exist. I mean, you're never looking at yourself. A bodybuilder looks at his body as a thing, you know, and he wants to develop this thing, and that's what he's looking at, but never at himself. Arnold's mirror tells him that he is not only the fairest of them all, but just about the only man in bodybuilding who has made any money out of it. For example, the last Mr. Olympia, considered among aficionados the world's champion of bodybuilding, received a measly $2,500 prize for a lifetime of grunting, jerking, and posing. And it gives me much pleasure to present to you the gold champion, the Hall of Champions, the 1977 Mr. California Bodybuilding, for the most part, is an entertainment or pastime designed almost entirely for the financial well-being of its promoters. The real money goes to men like Ben Weider, who runs something called the International Federation of Bodybuilders, which organizes most of the contests all around the world. Because our motto is, bodybuilding is good for nation building. He's also president of Weider Sports Equipment a company that markets all the hundreds of products that bodybuilders use, the weights and machines and pulleys that look like relics of the Spanish Inquisition, and creams and pills and diet supplements, all the equipment for the right balance of food and torture that promises to transform you from a 97-pound weakling into an Arnold Schwarzenegger. But there's another substance that helps. Steroids are taken uh, eight or nine, ten weeks before a competition. It's not a healthy thing to do, but uh, it, it's being used. 
Did you, did you take them? I take them. Yeah. I took them. Yeah, up until the competition, uh, eight or nine weeks before competition, and uh, it was something that everybody had to do in order to get an equal chance to, uh, you know, to compete. What are you what, seeking when you take steroids? Well, what uh, the effect it should have is that it makes you. Uh, gain more weight and that you get more muscularity and you get uh, it works a little bit also in your mind you know it, it lifts you up a little bit and you have more energy to train and so on the men who sell the pills and run the contests are the biggest winners in bodybuilding and strange characters abound it would seem that there are as many promoters of bodybuilding as there are participants well I agree with you there are a lot of strange characters around in this business but to promote something like that, that is that uh, young, it takes a lot of different people to promote it in the proper way. Arnold won't say how much money he makes promoting bodybuilding. He doesn't want to cause any ill feeling, but he's become a small conglomerate himself. Through bodybuilding, I did a lot of things, you know. I mean, I, I got into the films. I did uh, three films so far and one television uh, film. I have a very successful mail order business and I'm promoting bodybuilding competitions and I'm now working on my second book. And on and on and on. Arnold Schwarzenegger is a contented soul. His is one of those stories that is not supposed to have a happy ending. The big strapping kid pulled out of the Austrian hinterland is supposed to throw it all away to the promoters and a couple of floozies and end up a hopeless case on Skid Row. That's how fiction would have it. But not so Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's happy as a clam, strong as a horse. And if you find bodybuilding a funny thing for a grown-up, intelligent man to be doing, well, so does Arnold. And he's laughing with you all the way to the bank. Five years after this piece first aired, Arnold parlayed his muscles and his charm into a leading role as Conan the Barbarian, beginning his unlikely ascension to movie stardom. With the Terminator movies, Schwarzenegger became one of the biggest and highest paid leading men in Hollywood history, a master of the action genre. But in time, movie making lost its allure. And by the time Morley Safer met up with him again in 2004, 27 years after they first met, Arnold Schwarzenegger, once the bodybuilder's bodybuilder, was a year into his third career, governor of California. Why did you do it? Had you become bored, fed up with acting? Yes. And all of a sudden, I realized that, you know, I've done this. I've gotten to the top. I'm the highest paid actor that there, there ever was in the history. I'm a man. A machine. I've done all of those different things. <laughs> so I said to myself, you know, I'm tired of the same things. I'm, I'm you know, st jumping over car hoods at 3 in the morning and then going up to someone and says, I'm back. You know, and then blow him away or something. So all of this is great, but I mean, eventually it gets old. I, Arnold Schwarzenegger, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. Leaving the fantasy of Hollywood for the button-down world of politics in Sacramento was not all that big a step. Both places have big egos, both spend big money, and both are often economical with the truth. In politics, stardom works, but only up to a point. As the kind of movie star that you are, were, certainly, you could be a dictator. You could say, I want it, and it gets done. You no. can't do that now. You're absolutely correct. And uh, now this is different. But look, this is the great thing about it, about adjusting from one career to the next. And the key thing always is, is to keep your eye on the ball. Well, speaking of which, it took a lot of balls to go cold turkey into politics. Yes, but you know, I... Never had a lack of that, so <laughs> may I remind you. It makes no difference to me because I always say, what's the worst that can happen? Did you fail? I mean, you know, that is, that's really not that bad. We first met Arnold Schwarzenegger two careers back in 1977. He was 30, the king of the muscle man. Through bodybuilding, I did a lot of things, you know. I mean, I, I got into the films. And even then, he now says he was itching to move on. One day I stood there on the stage and I said, why am I standing here with my little posing trunks, oiled <laughs> up, trying to be the most muscular man? Why? He was always a quick study. And back then, he'd already figured out the key element to his success in bodybuilding, in the movies. I'll be back. And in politics. I feel 
that you can have the best product in the world, but if you don't know how to sell it, and if you don't, know, if you don't have anybody who can sell it for you or tell the public, it's a waste of time, the whole thing. I guess you kind of proved your point, yes? Oh, absolutely. And I still say that. Selling and communicating to the people is the most important thing. But you have to have an instinct for that. You can't learn that, right? You can't learn it. You have it or you don't have it. He's clearly got it, to the consternation of critics who doubted he could survive in the cutthroat world of politics. In terminating his highly unpopular predecessor, Democrat Gray Davis, Schwarzenegger's timing, once again, was perfect. You could not have asked for a better opponent than Gray Davis, who was right on the ropes. He time. was a jewel. <laughs> <laughs> he was good. When we return, Arnold takes on the California legislature and wins. In 2004, a year after taking office, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger's approval rating among Californians was running about 65 percent, a number any politician would envy. What would you give yourself as, in a report card now, after a year? An eight. An so eight? From eight to ten. If ten being the highest, I would give myself an eight. I think that it fell short on some of the things, um, probably with communications with, uh, with the legislators. He hit a rough patch with lawmakers during the summer delivering a remark that was pure Arnold. And I hope that those that want to sell out to the special interests, those girly men up there in Sacramento. Girly men. During a deadlock in budget talks, he aimed the line at Democrats in the legislature. And it drove them nuts. But the interesting thing about it is the following week, they sat down on the table and they signed the budget exactly the way it was a week before. He was trying, he says, to underscore his belief that the legislature was on an out-of-control spending spree, putting special interest ahead of the public good. I say, if you have the balls, you will go out there and say this to the people. If not, then you're a girly man. That's really what it is about. I think that they should have the guts to say that. Well, you have taken some heat over the issue of balancing the budget in the course of trying to pay the bills. You got deeper into debt. Did we solve the problem in one year? No. Morley, they've ruined the state. For five years, they kept spending. We are talking here about addicts. The people sent me to Sacramento to be the outside intervention. Hey, hey. Go, go. The honeymoon with voters and the state legislature came to a crashing halt in early 2005. Democrats and public employee unions went on the attack over the governor's proposed belt tightening. They dogged his steps with protests and flooded the state with critical TV spots. Governor Schwarzenegger, you ought to take your promises on education as seriously as we do. Schwarzenegger's approval rating sank 20 points in three months, forcing him on the defensive. Do you know that for every dollar the state takes in, the legislators spend $1.10? He commutes from Los Angeles to Sacramento every week. Showing us around the governor's domain in the Capitol building, he takes a kind of boyish pride in his wall of fame. Great moments in the Schwarzenegger administration. And it's a great shot. Look at this with the American flag. And you totally missed it. You just walked by. Poster boy. Okay, I forgive you Poster for that. boy. Forgive you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Even in the driest of settings, a meeting of his economic advisors, there's a Hollywood touch. Greeting the diminutive Nobel Prize winner, Milton Friedman, reminds the governor of his one-time co-star, Danny DeVito. This is Twins 2. Look at this. <laughs> twins 2. Perfect. This is the smoking tent. Oh, it's wonderful. This is where we made a lot of the deals. For, for, uh... You live like a pasha. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that. That's a little carried away. But I mean... He wheels and deals in his smoking tent set up in an open-air courtyard near his office. A place to schmooze and cajole, light up the biggest cigar in the world, and for good measure, outrage health advocates. Here, for instance, we have Maria's wall. Mm -hmm. When we came into office, Maria walked around the horseshoe here, and she says, well, where are all the first ladies? 
His wife, Maria Shriver, has been a high-profile first lady, active in women's causes. But the governor is quick to point out their political differences. I show you Maria's office quickly, which is back here. Now she, of course, has to be further away from my office because she's a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> Not just any Democrat, but a Kennedy, which made it all the more unusual in the summer of 2004 when she went where no Kennedy had ventured before, the Republican convention, where she watched her husband wow delegates with a tried and true Schwarzeneggerism. And to those critics who are so pessimistic about our economy, I say, don't be economic girly man. As for his endorsement of President Bush, send him back to Washington for four more years. He later joked that it got him a cold shoulder, literally, a cold shoulder at home. Well, there was no sex for 14 days. <laughs> Normally, even a first-term California governor with Schwarzenegger's star power would be talked about as a potential future presidential candidate. But being foreign-born, he can't run. There are attempts to change that. You are ineligible, obviously, to run for president. Would you like to be able to? Would you like to see an amendment to the Constitution? Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, because why not? I mean, you know, anyone that is... Uh, is like with my way of thinking you always shoot for the top you know but it's not something that i'm i'm preoccupied with i'm not uh, thinking one single minute about that because there's so many things that i have to do in california and my promise was to straighten out the mess in california we concluded our visit with the governor by showing him the last few seconds of our first encounter 27 years ago back when he was a 30-year-old on a very fast track. Arnold Schwarzenegger is a contented soul. He's happy as a clam, strong as a horse. And if you find bodybuilding a funny thing for a grown-up, intelligent man to be doing, well, so does Arnold. And he's laughing with you all the way to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> what do you make of that kid? It's amazing to see that. So you have to get me a tape of that. I will, I will. And I'm still laughing. <laughs> Not all the way to the bank. My wife is screaming, now I make no money. Because... <laughs> but at least have a good time. And it's, a, it's a, a challenging job, and I'm having the greatest time in the world doing this. Arnold Schwarzenegger may not be thinking about running for president, but he has some backers who are. They're trying to convince Congress and the states to pass an amendment to the Constitution that would give foreign-born citizens the right to run. And if by some chance Schwarzenegger were to get that opportunity, you can bet he'd have to confront some old skeletons in his closet, like the steroid use he talked to Morley Safer about in 1977. In 2005, Schwarzenegger says he now opposes illegal steroid use and has called for a crackdown. But he stopped short of saying he was sorry that he had used the bodybuilding substances when they were legal. When we return... We'll hear more about Renaissance man Arnold Schwarzenegger from 60 Minutes creator Don Hewitt.